Okay, so I have 15 minutes to talk about this, and it's a very important topic. I think this is probably one of the most important topics going on in their entire world right now, which is how to scale the Bitcoin payments experience, the non-custodial Bitcoin payments experience. And you'll notice that I'm not talking about scaling Bitcoin, the network, really the payments experience. And I'm focused on a very specific use case that I want to be possible, which is that I, as the end user, I want to be able to download a Bitcoin mobile wallet and immediately be able to receive a payment of a hundred bucks. Um, I am also maybe a merchant or I am buying Bitcoin on the non-custodial Bitcoin exchange. And since bull Bitcoin is a non-custodial Bitcoin exchange, um, we don't really have a choice for the user to be able to do that because if the user is not able to receive a hundred dollar um, Bitcoin payment, that means that the minimum buy amounts on bull Bitcoin is going to have to be way more than that if we're not able to scale this experience. So just on the state of lightning, on the non-custodial exchange side, so from the bit, bull Bitcoins like backend infrastructure of lightning, um, lightning works really well. So, you know, we have tons of Bitcoin node softwares, wallet API servers, managing an institutional lightning node is totally doable and relatively easy to have balanced channels. Um, with the advance of uh, LNURL pay and LNURL withdraw protocols, the UX of selling and sending Bitcoin payments to people is 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 pretty smooth. Um, back in the day, you know, you had to get the user to give you an invoice if you were paying them, and it was a terrible user experience. So, like, so so from my perspective, as operating the exchange, Lightning works really well. There's some issues like stuck payments, but overall, Lightning works really well. Um, from the non-custodial um, wallet side, like for developers, um, you know, if you're uh, if you want to be non-custodial in Lightning, you need to be able to run a node on your mobile device. We have tons of software. Um, LDK, for example, is uh, is allowing you to run a node on your phone. Um, you can have a remote node on a third-party server. This is the Breeze and Greenlight um, uh, method. Um, you can sync with the network graph. You can do your channel backups. All of, all of this is, has been solved. Um, offline receiving is, is you know, uh, it, it kind of solved, but not really. So the user is able to download a, a mobile wallet, um, self-custodial, run the node on their phone, um, but it won't be a very good routing node. So very few nodes would like purposefully want to connect and lock with liquidity with your mobile lightning node. So that's why the Lightning community came with, with the Lightning service provider model. So if I want to receive a $100 payment, someone needs to open a channel with my node, but my node sucks. So nobody wants to do that. So I'm going to have to um, pay someone to do that. So professional liquidity service providers um, can be paid to open a channel with me. There's mar multiple LSPs on the market right now. There's a, there's a standardization process that called the LSP specs right now going on. So that model has been um, well developed. Um, and let's say again, I'm a merchant. I want to receive $100. I just downloaded the, um, the mobile wallet. I want to be able to receive 100 bucks. There is something called the just-in-time model. So the client is going to be paying me, but the payment is actually going to be routed through the LSP. And the LSP will open a channel with me, the receiver, at the same time as the sender is sending the payment. So I don't have to open a channel before someone pays me. The channel is going to be opened on the fly. Um, I will have to trust the LSP until the transaction confirms on the blockchain. I'm going to have to pay an LSP fee. The LSP can close that channel whenever they want, whenever it sues them. Um, and I also have to pay the, um, the, the network fee. So I at Bull Bitcoin was trying to um, create a non-custodial Bitcoin mobile app using this um, this uh, this technique, the just-in-time channel, that I actually try to integrate with something called the Breeze SDK. And as I was integrating this um, this this type of software, and I, I as I was using it, um, I noticed that um, there was a few issues, which we're gonna talk about right now. Okay, so let's say that um, I'm a merchant, um, or I'm buying Bitcoin on an Oculus Bitcoin exchange. I'm buying a hundred dollars. The LSP is going to be open, opening a channel with me. That's going to be something like, he, he's going to add maybe something like 50 bucks of inbound liquidity, right? It's going to be like 100,000 sats or 50,000 sats. So uh, the LSP opens a channel, which is, let's say in this case, 160 bucks. And I'm receiving through this first channel opening 100 bucks. So that means that I have 
$60 of inbound capacity. Okay, cool. Let's say I want to open another, I want to buy another $100 worth of Bitcoin on the exchange. I only have $60 of inbound uh, liquidity, so the LSP is going to have to open another channel with me. All right. Um, I want to buy another 100 bucks. The LSP is going to have to open another channel with me. So every time I'm receiving 100 bucks of Bitcoin from this non custodial exchange or as a merchant, the LSP is opening a channel with me, which is two Bitcoin transactions. So obviously, that makes absolutely no sense. And that's kind of like what I realized through this experience is this just-in-time model doesn't work when the end user is receiving funds and not actively spending funds. Um, so uh, that, that was, you know, intellectually, I always knew that this was going to be kind of a problem. Um, but I was in uh, El Salvador for the Adopting Bitcoin conference, you know, and I was trying to orange peel people and telling them to download the Phoenix wallet. So, you know, try to replicate the experience that I want. Okay, download Phoenix wallet and I'm going to send you $5 in sats and from my own Phoenix wallet or from another wallet. And as the LSP was opening that channel, um, there was a $25 channel opening fee that was being charged. So I was paying 25 bucks to send $5. Um, obviously that doesn't really work. And also with some, uh, right now with splicing, we've kind of solved this issue, but if I'm opening uh, you know, I don't know, like 10 channels worth of $100. Um, you know, there's 10 UTXOs that are going to be created uh, as a result. And, you know, a UTXO really shouldn't be sh shouldn't be more than, uh, less than, you know, 500 bucks because those UTXOs are going to be economically unspendable in the future. So the just-in-time model, which is kind of like the default onboarding, non-custodial onboarding experience of Lightning um, doesn't really work, unfortunately. And it's not, and it's not a UX problem, you know. So I, I've kind of like, I, it's it's not a UX problem. It's a fundamentally economic problem, and it's a fundamental design choice of of Lightning, which makes it um, not really viable. There's another way to do this, which which is that um, you can. Sorry, oh, sorry. There's another way to do this, which is uh, I can pre-purchase um, inbound liquidity, right? So this is something that um, you know Bitkit is doing. Um, it's something that Phoenix uh, Wallet also does which is that, um, let's say that I know that I'm going to be receiving a lot of payments um, and I don't want to have to uh, have a channel open every time I go like a hundred bucks or something like that. I can pre-purchase a thousand dollars worth of liquidity, um, which is fine. I'm going to have more inbound liquidity. The UX is not too complicated. And let's say that I receive like $900 worth of payments. And, you know, in that case, I only have a hundred dollars left of inbound capacity. I can always loop out and essentially move those lightning bitcoins onto the main chain um through a loop out service and then you know my channel is still there i can i can still receive so like all of this is from a ux standpoint and operation standpoint it's like it's not bad um there is a drawback though it does require the user to have bitcoin in the first place so that they are able to pre-purchase that liquidity so it's not like super great for like the first onboarding um there is a problem though with this is that the lsp does have to lock a thousand bucks with that user for an unknown amount of time. And will that scale? Well, if you have a million users of, for example, Phoenix, and each one of these users is pre-purchasing a thousand dollar channel, now you have a billion dollars that you have to lock in as an LSP to all those people. And it's not like it's locked into, you know, a very secure multi-sig, like that buddy is on a hot wallet, like on a server. And sure, there's things you can do to secure that with, and I know Phoenix, for example, is using um, uh, Intel, chip security or something like that. Um, but realistically, um, there's no LSP that has like a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, so the LSP is necessarily going to have to borrow Bitcoin from, you know, some whale or some institution in order to have that liquidity. And how much are they going to pay for that liquidity? Well, think about you. How much would you charge annually um, to lend out Bitcoin to someone else? I mean, I don't know, but I certainly wouldn't accept anything less than five to 10%, um, maybe the market's going to be different. Maybe the LSPs are going to be able to get good deals because they're not like investing the Bitcoin. They're just locking them in. But it is definitely going to require a lot of liquidity to be locked up. And I'm not sure that this is going to be extremely scalable. Uh, it's definitely going to have some, some scalability problems. The other problem is that uh, also the LSP has to keep that channel open. If that channel, channel is not profitable for the LSP, um, they're going to be uh, closing it. So as someone who's trying to build a non-custodial 
Lightning Network wallet. I'm looking at these two models. The just-in-time model just doesn't work for me at all. This model, it it, it would have worked. Uh, it would have been possible to build a wallet like this. Obviously, Phoenix has done it, and they've done a great job. BitKid has done it. But this requires me to believe that there will be LSPs that are willing to lock up massive amounts of money for very long periods of time. And I just didn't think that this is some, something that's that's likely to happen or, or scalable. I'm sure the LSPs have a, a different idea about that, but um, it, it, it definitely wasn't easy to, to pull off um, from a development standpoint. And again, economically, there, there's just a lot of issues with this. So I'm, I'm building this wallet and what do I do, right? So there's always a custodial model, which obviously works. Everybody knows Wallet of Satoshi. I've been involved with the Bitcoin Jungle project, which is like like Blink, you know, the Bitcoin Beach wallet. Um, it's just a traditional, you know, database that allows you to send and receive uh, Bitcoin like payments. Um, but Bull Bitcoin doesn't want to be custodial. So I don't want to develop a custodial wallet of which I am the custodian. So that means that another custodian would need to be included in my app. Okay, so what custodian within would, would I trust? Because if the user cannot have, or it's, it's not it's not easy for my user to have this non-custodial user experience, I need to recommend the custodian and I need to partner essentially with the custodian. Um, so, you know, if you're evaluating the, the custody models, um, and I'm just going to, yeah, if if I'm evaluating custody models, okay, so so what am I looking for in a, in a custodian or a custodian solution? Well, can that does that custodian allow the users to send permissionless payments um, between each other? Um, does that custodian allow on-chain settlement potential or withdrawal? Um, what is the malicious rug pull potential of that uh, custodian? Is the custodian is just gonna is gonna rug us? Uh, what's the potential for the custodian to accidentally rug pull the users? Like, do they have expertise? What's the long-term continuity model of that custodian? You know, motivation and financing. You know, we have custodians that just stop being motivated. You know, Blue Wallet was running a, um, a custodian and eventually they just stopped. And, you know, I'm sure they didn't want to rug their users or so, anything like that. But, you know, they, 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 they stopped uh, custodying. And if you have your coins on... On Blue Wallet, well, you know, the coins are now in the possession of Blue Wallet. Um, the payments anonymity, like does the custodian allow you to make anonymous payments? What's the recoverability model? So what happens if you lose your mobile phone? What's the cost, long-term scalability? What's the user experience? And I've kind of like come up with this kind of model where one model of custody is the custodial accounts. These are permissioned payments, permission settlement, legal recovery based or account recovery based. And they don't have any anonymity by default. And this is going to be Wallet of Satoshi, Coinbase, just an exchange uh, or an ETF or something like this. A custodial bearer asset model of custody has permissionless payments, but it has permissionless payments, but permission settlement. Um, that is like, for example, Fediment, eCash, uh, Cashew, and like the Liquid Network, where you can send funds within Cashew or within Fediment or within Liquid without requiring the permission of the um, the custodian. But to do a settlement, like to withdraw back to on-chain, you need to have the permission of the federation or of the custodian. Uh, the recovery is different. It's a cryptographic-based recovery. So, you know, Bitcoin Jungle Wallet, you use your phone, you recover with your phone number. eCash, if you lose your phone, you need to have a backup of your eCash token. And anonymity is possible at, at this level, but it's not guaranteed because whichever is the gateway that is going to allow you to withdraw funds from the custodian to the chain could very well ask you for KYC. Even though they might not do today, they might do in the future. And the layer two like Lightning, what makes it different, uh, what makes it different is that permissionless payments, but you also have permissionless settlements. So also called unilateral withdrawal. So if you cannot unilaterally withdraw from your custodian, then it's not a layer two. So Liquid Network is not layer two, Fedimit is not layer two, Cashew is not layer two. These are what I call custodial bearer assets. So this is kind of like the scale of the least secure to most secure. And bear in mind, this is just kind of like an idea that I'm working on. It's not science. At the far left, you have ETFs, which you cannot pay anyone. You cannot withdraw your Bitcoin from the ETF. And it's obviously not anonymous. Then you have like Coinbase exchanges, you know, whatever. Then you have wallets like Wallet of Satoshi, um, which are equi equivalent to. And on the first line here, you have custodial accounts. And then on the second line here, you have more like the custodial bearer assets. So, you know, Cashew. 
is just as secure as, you know, Wallet of Satoshi. There's no security difference. There's, there's no real difference in terms of security model between Cashew and Wallet of Satoshi. It's the same thing. And then you have eCash federations like Fediment, but eCash federations can be implemented in multiple different ways. So if you have a federation within a company where the CEO, the CTO, and the CFO own a key, you know, it's a two or three, well, it's the same thing as a, as a single eCash mint, right? But if you have like a very large federation of 10 to 20 to 30 companies all over the world, then, you know, it, 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 can, it can become safer depending on how it's implemented. Then there is no Fediment federation right now. So I cannot judge how secure it is, but technically it could, it could go to a, to a model where there's so many, you know, signers and so many guardians in, in, in their lingo that it could be pretty secure. And then you have the Liquid Federation, which exists. Um, Liquid has an 11 of 15 multi-sig. We're going to talk about that. Sorry, Marseille, I know I'm running uh, over time, but I uh, know you're not going to cut me, sorry. Um, but uh, Liquid Federation, um, it's, uh, it's out there and uh, it's pretty good. And then you have a big chasm between all of the custody models and the self-custody. I didn't want to put them in the same linearity. And what you see on this scale here is that there is models of custody which I consider to be unacceptable. They're all the ones that are on the left. And there is a kind of compromise zone there that I think that we're going to have to make. Because remember, I talked about the problems of that accepting a $100 payment, which doesn't really work with self-custodial lightning. So we do have to make some kind of compromise. And that's the topic of my talk, the idea of making this kind of compromise here. Um, so I think that lightning, lightning um, is a great settlement layer, which is kind of ironic because we used to say that Bitcoin is a settlement layer, lightning is a payments layer, but lightning is actually a very good settlement layer between all of those types of custodians, you know? So you can go from the exchange, the eCash mission, the eCash federation, from Liquid. And um, it's not exactly like interoperability per se, but um, you can use these different custodians can use Lightning to settle in between each other. Because if I have a Cashew account and you have a Liquid Network account, obviously we cannot transact, um, but those custodians can transact with each other using Lightning, and I can port my value, you know, from from my Cashew account to your Fedibit account. Um, so we're gonna be, uh, you know, I believe in self-custodial Lightning, but we have to realize its shortcomings. Lightning hasn't failed, but Lightning has not held up to this promise of allowing everybody on the world to be able to receive small amounts of money, um, really simply. Uh, so we're gonna be using these custodial barrier assets for looping in and out. You're gonna be receiving and sending small payments via custodial barrier assets in the future. I think this is kind of like where we're going. Lightning is gonna be used as, a, as an interoperability. I put it in cold because it's not interoperable. It's more like an exchange between assets and as a settlement layer. And um, you know, uh, I'm out of time, but uh, I know a lot of people are excited about, you know, um, Cashew, Fediments and all that. I just like to uh, remind people that the, li the Liquid Network actually exists. There is a system using the Bolt atomic swap system where people can hold Liquid Network in uh, as, as a balance and whatever they're making lightning payments, it's a non-custodial swap that's happening. I think this is the way that the industry is evolving. Mutiny Wallet wants to do this with Fediment as well. There's an example of this in the wild with Aqua uh, Wallet. Um, so Bull Bitcoin is building this system currently. So we are building, we have built a liquid network wallet that works with bolts to have um, instant non-custodial swaps in and out. And um, we really did try as long as we could to build a true, pure non-custodial wallet, but it just didn't serve our use case. So that's, that's the end.